Marsh, how you how y'all doing? We doing good? We doing good? Yeah, so good. Somebody say, so good? So good. All right, y'all. Well, welcome back. We're super stoked that you're here. Somebody say, super stoked? Super stoked that you guys are back. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you are here for the very first time, my name is Dylan. I'm the youth pastor here at North Shore, and I'd love to meet you. So come say hey after service. I'll get you something free from our Snack Shack. Uh, if you are planning on taking notes tonight, but you forgot to grab notes when you grabbed your chair, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll have somebody bring you some notes and a pen. Um, and then at the end of service, somebody say later. Later. You, every single person in the room is going to need a pen. Okay, so if you don't have one now, just remember you got to grab one here in a little bit. Somebody say a little bit. All right, so we're going to get into this. We are in week three of Grace Bomb Reloaded. Somebody say Reloaded. Reloaded. Week three of Grace Bomb Reloaded. And, and again, this is a series that we have kind of been coming back to for the last few years. 2021, 2022, we've done a, a portion of Grace Bomb. And this is just a continuation of of that and the reason is because I want Grace Bomb to become a part of our DNA, right? Somebody say it's in my heart. I want this to become a part of our DNA. One of our core values here is that serving isn't just something that we do, it's who we are. And so my hope, my heart with this series at this is that this is going to become a part of our DNA, that we will begin to live out what we're learning about. Yes? 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 yes. I want us to live out what we're learning about. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about how to not become bad Samaritans, right? We talked about the story of the good Samaritan and, and how the, the, the priest and the Levite, they just walked past this guy who was bleeding and dying on the side of the road, but a Samaritan came by and slowed down, right? We get so busy, but the Samaritan came by and slowed down and picked this guy up and took care of him and, and, and paid all the cost. And, and we want to be good Samaritans. We want to be able to see the opportunities that, that, that God is giving us to love our neighbors with no strings attached. But not just see them, we want to step into them. Yes? 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 yes. And so last week we talked about the Holy Spirit. We talked about how the Holy Spirit is the ultimate influencer in our lives. That it's only by his influence and inspiration and indwelling that we can succeed at loving our neighbor with no strings attached. And so following on from that message, uh, tonight we're going to be looking at how we can uh, keep from quenching the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Last week we talked about how the Holy Spirit wants to work in our life. And this week we want to talk about how the Holy Spirit can be quenched. If, if, if we are leaning into sin, if we are leaning into certain things, the Holy Spirit is going to be quenched and, and he's not able to move in our lives. Because honestly, there, there are certain things that we lean into that put a wall up between us and him. And so the title of my message, if you're taking notes, you got it in front of you already, you already know this. But if you're not, the title of my message is Demo Day. Demo Day. How many of you have ever done a, uh, a remodel on your home or you've helped your parents with a remodel on a home or a property or a business or something like that, right? The best day is Demo Day. Come on, right? That's the best day when you just get to break stuff and punch through drywall and, and do all that. And so we're just going to talk about Demo Day because the truth is, is that as we follow Jesus, there are certain things that we can lean into that will build a wall between us and him. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? Yeah. And by certain things, I mean sin. Somebody say sin. sin. Sin is something that will put a wall between us and Jesus. It becomes this wall between us and the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives because the truth is that sin is a great separator. Sin is the great separator. Sin is what separated Adam from Eve, Adam and Eve from God, right? In the very beginning when, when God had to kick them out of paradise, it was because of sin. Sin separated Adam and Eve from God. And sin is still what separates us from God now. Sin separates us from eternal life now. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is what? Death. Somebody say death. death. Somebody say death. death. The wages of sin is is death. Sin is this great separator. And, and, and without Jesus, let me say, but Jesus. but Jesus. Sin separates us from God, but Jesus. The, the wages of sin is death, but there's redemption in that. The Bible tells us that the gift of God, the free gift of God, is eternal life 
through Jesus. And so outside of Jesus, we are separated from God because of our sin. But then we give our lives to Jesus and everything's perfect, right? Or no? Yes or no? Yeah. Somebody said no. Nah. No. Somebody said no. Nah. No. No, things, things aren't perfect after we give our lives to Jesus. Why? Because we're still not perfect. Because we're still fallen people who live in a fallen world. And so inevitably, we're going to fall into sin again. Or more accurate, accurately, we're going to walk into sin again. Inevitably, we're going to walk into temptation. And, and we're going to operate in old patterns. And, and as we do, that wall between us and God, it begins to go up again. Yeah? Jesus came and he died on the cross for our sins. And he took that wall out. He took away that separation. But our sin continues to build a wall with every decision, with every action that is opposed to God. All of those things build up a wall between us and him. And, and I've heard Christians talk about how, well, once you give your life to Jesus, you're not a sinner anymore. You're a saint. And you never sin anymore. I literally had a guy tell me that. He said, I don't believe that I sin. I said, man, you've got to read the Bible, <laughs> right? Like, what does Paul say? If, if Paul struggles with sin, then, then how much are we going to? Paul says, I am the chief of sinners, right? Paul said, I, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I want to do. Like, if Paul is struggling with this, how much more are we going to struggle with this? And so the truth is, is, is sin is still very real, even after we give our lives to Jesus. And so we have to be intentional to lean into the Holy Spirit, and lean into Jesus, and lean into the Bible, and, and, and spending time with Jesus so that we don't keep building that wall. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? Yeah. So Paul talks about the Holy Spirit, and, and not grieving the Holy Spirit with the sin in our lives. In Ephesians 4.30, he says this, do not Grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed on the day of redemption. So remember last week we talked about the Holy Spirit. We talked about how the Holy Spirit is our influencer. Somebody say influencer. He's our influencer. As we live our lives following Jesus, the Holy Spirit is the one who inspires us, gives us inspiration to do the things that he's calling us to do. And, and what Paul is telling us here is that the Holy Spirit can be grieved, right? Right? That, that, that when we live contrary to what he's calling us to do in the way he's calling us to live, that grieves the Holy Spirit. He's grieved and his work can be quenched if we're not pursuing holiness. Uh, a few weeks back, we, we did a series called Hot Topics. How many of you were here for that? Anybody? And in that series, Hot Topics, we, we talked about uh, pornography and we talked about uh, LGBTQIA+. We talked about all of that stuff and, uh, and it was awkward, right? How many of y'all are glad to not be in that series anymore? Anybody? I, I for sure am. It gets awkward. It gets awkward saying all the kind of words that you got to say and things like that. But, so we talked about in both of those messages, we talked about how God's, God's design for our lives is not that we would be happy all of the time, but that we would become holy. Yes? Yes? God's design is not that we would be happy. Yes, God cares about our happiness, but he cares more about our holiness than he does about our happiness. And so the Holy Spirit is grieved when we stop pursuing holiness, when we stop pursuing God's best for our lives, when we begin to choose our own way, when we begin to choose comfort over his call on our lives, when we choose anything other than his best, it grieves him. And that wall starts going up again. Right? Does this make sense? Yes? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. And sin... As, as we build this wall, this sin creates this barrier that hinders our grace bombing impact. Grace bombing, again, as we talk about this, we're talking about loving our neighbors with no strings attached, going out of our way to just love on people, looking for opportunities to love on people, looking for opportunities to bless people and, and, and just bomb them with grace, right? And, and, and our ability to do that diminishes greatly when we have this wall between us and God, when we are in habitual and perpetual sin, there's this wall and, and it blocks the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Ultimately, it's, it's hard to grow in hearing from the Holy Spirit and acting in obedience to what he's telling us to do if we're simultaneously not listening to him in other areas of our lives. If we're actively ignoring his voice in regards to the sin in our lives, why do we think that we could listen for his voice in being kind and grace-bombing other people? 
right? It, it just it just doesn't really make sense. Like it, it's hard to grace bomb people when we are not walking in grace ourselves. Yes? Yes? Yeah. It, it's it's hard to point people to Jesus when we're not pursuing Jesus. It's hard to tell people that in Jesus there is forgiveness of sins and hope for eternity when we are walking in habitual sin. We, we can't tell the world Jesus transforms lives when we're living our lives exactly like the world, right? Does this make sense? Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's hard to do that. It's hard to walk in grace bombing people if we aren't walking in being people of grace. People who are led by grace and filled with with grace. How many of you know the story of David? Anybody recognize the story of David? You've, you've heard of him, right, in the Bible? David was the, the little boy who, who killed Goliath, and later on he became the king over all of Israel. We're familiar with this, yes? Raise your hand if you are. So we're familiar with the story of David. I want to talk a little bit about later on in David's life. David uh, became king over Israel, and and in 2 Samuel, there is this story that plays out where we see King David uh, in a place where he shouldn't be and he sees something that he shouldn't see and then he ends up doing something that he shouldn't have done Right, and so King David is uh, it's it's this season the Bible tells us it's this season where kings go off to war But David chooses not to David stays at home. He sends his soldiers out He sends his battalions out. He sends everybody out, but David decides no, I'm, I'm just gonna chill at home I'm not going off to war this year and so David is at home he's in his palace and because he's in a place that he shouldn't be right this was not normal for kings to stay home when they sent their people out to go and battle the king would lead them and so for him to stay home this was this was wild and so so King David stays home and and as he's home and his 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 battalions are off to battle David is walking out on the roof of his palace and he sees something he's he's somewhere that he shouldn't be right and he sees something that he shouldn't see, and he looks out, and he notices that this beautiful woman woman is, is bathing, right? And, and he doesn't, like, notice, like, oh, she's bathing, right? It's, it's not like that. Like, he notices, and then he notices. And he notices, right? And, and David starts to get a little bit creepy with it, right? He, he's starting to stare at this woman who is bathing and he questions his servants then about it. He's like, who, who is this beautiful woman who's bathing on, on this rooftop? Who is this? And, and the servant tells him, well, that's, that's Bathsheba. That's, that's actually the wife of Uriah. And David knew Uriah. Uriah was one of David's mighty men. Uriah was, was one of the men who fought alongside David, who was actually a, a very close acquaintance of David. And Uriah was also one of the men that was now out fighting the battle that David dipped on and he stayed at home. And because David was in a place where he shouldn't have been, he saw something that he shouldn't have seen and now he's doing something that he shouldn't do. And so he knows that this is Uriah's wife, but he calls for her anyways. And so the servants bring Bathsheba in and David with all of the influence that he have has, creepy Dave, right? <laughs> creepy Dave seduces Bathsheba and, and, and she ends up sleeping with him. And not only does she sleep with him, but then she gets pregnant. Somebody say, uh-oh. She gets pregnant, right? And so now David is spiraling. And he's, he's trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do about this? And so he calls her husband back. He calls Uriah back, and, and he brings him home. And he tells Uriah, you know what? You've been doing such a good job. I want you to go. I want you to just enjoy being home for a little bit. I want you to enjoy time with your wife. And, and, and essentially, he's trying to get Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba so that he can cover up that this baby is David's. But Uriah, being a man of character... Being a man of integrity, this is, I, I named my son after Uriah. I want my son to be a man of character. I want my son to be a man of integrity. I want my son, regardless of what the world is saying to him, regardless of what authority is saying to him, I want him to pursue God. Yes? Yeah. And so Uriah, being a man of character and a man of integrity, he says, I, I, there's no way that I can enjoy the comforts of home while everybody else is fighting and dying on this battlefield. And so David knows that he's not going to get it this way. And so he sends Uriah back to the battlefield. And he sends a, a sealed letter to the commander at the battlefield and says, I want you to put Uriah at the front of the fighting lines where the casualties are heaviest. And so they send Uriah out there. Uriah ends up dying. David ends up marrying Bathsheba. All of this is done in an effort to cover up sin. Somebody say sin. sin. It's all done in an effort to cover up the sin that David had now committed. And so we see the story now pick up in 2 Samuel 
chapter 12, God speaks to this man named Nathan, and he tells Nathan, I want you to go and I want you to confront David. David's living in sin. David's covering up his sin, and it has put a wall between me and the king of Israel, the king of my people. I don't want this wall to be there, so Nathan, go and, and handle this. And so this is what it says in verses 1 through 4. It says, the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said, so he begins to tell David a story. Somebody say story. He begins to tell David a story. He says this. There were two men in a certain city, the one man rich and the other man poor. The rich man had a whole lot of flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little lamb, which he had bought. And he bought it, and he brought it up, and, he, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat from his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. And so the, this rich man has a whole lot, and this poor man just has one lamb. And as he's raising this lamb, this lamb basically becomes a part of his family. How many of y'all got a pet? Anybody got a pet? Do you love your pet? Does your pet ever eat off your plate? Does your pet ever drink out of your cup? No, that's gross. But that's what this lamb was doing, right? This guy loved his lamb enough to let him drink out of his cup. This was like his pet. This was like family to him. Nathan continues. He says, now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. And so what it's saying is the rich man, somebody say rich man, rich man. who had plenty, somebody say plenty. plenty, he could have taken from his plenty and prepared something for this traveler, but instead of taking from his plenty and giving to this traveler, it says this, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. This is messed up, right? Somebody say, that's messed, up. that's messed up. The rich man feeds the traveler the poor man's pet. That's messed up, right? He, he, he cooked up some lamb, he cooked up whatever this was, and, and he fed it to this traveler. But we, we can see that there's some pretty clear symbolism here, right? David is clearly the rich man. He had plenty. He had everything that he could ever need. Uriah was the poor man. All he had was his wife Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the lamb. Right? Cherished by her husband. Her husband loved her and took care of her and did everything that he could to make sure that she was safe and secure. And, and so all of this is going on. And then this traveler is David's lust and, and, and temptation. David's lust and temptation is that traveler that comes along and is seeking something to devour. And so David had, had not just seen something that he wasn't supposed to see. Now he's letting this spiral into a whole list of sin that begins building up a barrier between him and God. Does this make sense? Say yeah. yeah. Does this make sense? Yeah. He's, he's not just seeing something he shouldn't see, but now there's this barrier between him and God. And, and, and David didn't really see the connection in the story. He didn't connect the story of what he had done to what this, this Nathan is telling him. And so David responds in, five, in, in verses 5 and 6 and says, David's anger was greatly kindled against this man. So David hears about this rich man that does this terrible thing, and he's like, this is ridiculous. He gets angry, angry. Somebody say angry, angry. angry. He gets big man. And so he says this, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. Somebody say he's dead. He's dead. The man who did this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, four times as much as he took from this poor man. He's going to give it back because he did this thing and because he had no pity. You know what's funny? Somebody say it's funny. it's funny. It's funny how it's really easy to see sin in other people's lives, but we often fail to recognize sin in our own lives. Right? It's really easy to look at other people's lives and be like, oh, you're missing it here. Oh, you missed this. Oh, you didn't do that. Oh, you're, you're, you're doing this and, and, it, and it's against God's will. It's really easy to point sin out in other people's lives. But sometimes it's a lot more difficult to recognize it in our own lives. David hears this story from Nathan. He, he knows that what Nathan has just told him is completely unfair and unjust and justice needs to be served. But he didn't apply this story to anything that he had done until Nathan drops the truth bomb. Somebody say truth bomb. Truth bomb. Now I know our series is called Grace Bomb. A truth bomb is, is usually a lot more uncomfortable than a grace bomb. And so Nathan drops this truth bomb in verse 7 and he says, you are the man. 
He says, listen, David, I just told you the story and you said the man who's done this deserves to die. You need to hear this, king. You are that man. You're, you're the man who, who stole from the poor man. You're the man who took everything. E even though you had an abundance, you took everything from this person. You're trying to cover up this sin. You are the man. And, and, and he reminds David of how much the Lord has blessed David throughout his life. And, and then he begins to tell David about the consequences that are going to happen because of this sin and because of the cover up. And now David is finally starting to get it. And in verse 13, it says, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David's done covering it up. He, he's done hiding it. He's done pretending like, like he's done nothing wrong. David just admits it. Listen, I, I've sinned against the Lord. I've missed it. And then David goes on to say that, or Nathan goes on to say to David, the Lord has put away your sin and you shall not die. David said the man who did this deserves to die. Right? David knew the scripture that said the wages of sin is death. That David knew what the cost of sin was. David knew that sin separates him from God. David knew that he deserved to die for what he had done. But, but where, where David would have killed the man, God gives grace. Aren't you so thankful for that? Yeah. That even, even when we're building that wall, God has given grace. And he's going to challenge us and he's going to try to redirect us and he's going to convict us so that we don't continue to build that wall, so that we don't continue to live in sin. But God gives grace. And I'm so grateful for that. And I tell you this story because this story is our story. Some say it's mine. mine. Some say it's mine. mine. This story is our story. Hopefully not all of the nitty gritty details, right? Like hopefully you're not being like creepy Dave. You're not spying on people while they're showering. Hopefully you're not trying to use your influence to get people to sleep with you. Hopefully you're not killing somebody to cover it all up, right? But the truth is, is, is we all have sin. Somebody say sin. sin. We all have sin. We all have areas in our lives where we miss God's mark and, and we have this barrier between us and God. And that ongoing sin hinders the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to us. The Holy Spirit wants to direct us and, and change us and use us. And, and the truth is is, is, is we don't have a Nathan now, but we do have God's word. Yeah? Remember last week we talked about how the Holy Spirit, he gives influence and oftentimes he gives influence because he illuminates scripture and he speaks to us through his word already. And I told you that how if your Bible is dusty, your faith probably is too. This is true. If we're not spending time in God's word, we're not going to know God's word. And if we don't know God's word, we're not going to know where we are missing it. We're not going to know where we aren't lining up our lives with what God's word already says. And so God's word acts as Nathan now, and, and, and he encourages us and he challenges us now. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, I know we read this last week. It says this, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. The Holy Spirit wants us to go to work. Yeah? 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 yeah. yeah. The Holy Spirit wants to direct our lives and guide our lives and lead our lives and point us in the direction of people who don't know him yet so that we can drop grace bombs on them and implicate Jesus in the process and point people to Jesus that they would come to know him as Lord and Savior. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. And oftentimes he's going to direct us by the word of God. And it's not meant to be shaming. It's not meant to condemn us. It's meant to correct us. Yes? It's meant to put us on a new course. It's, it's saying, listen, there's a barrier between you and God. Let's do something about this. It's demo day. Somebody say it's demo day. It's demo day. He's saying, listen, it's demo day. We got to do something about this. My, uh, my wife and her sister, they own a boutique in town. Some of you know this. And, uh, and they actually just bought, recently, they bought the building right next to Eileen's. And so it smells good all the time. Come on, somebody. Right? I just want to smell cookies all day. And so they, they bought this building right next to Eileen's. And, and when we bought it, it, it was fine, but there's, there was a lot of separation in the building. And, and as we've been talking about it, we want there to be this open concept from, from front to back. We, we want the entire building to just be open from one end to the next. And, and before, there was a lot of stuff that separated. There was extra walls, and there was a low ceiling, and, and, and the bathroom was pretty nasty and smelly. But all of that aside, we, we begin to do some demo. Somebody say demo. We, we had 
demo day. Somebody say demo day. And so that's what we did. We, we have a plan for this building and, and we want to, to be able to move freely throughout the building. And so we had to remove the things that were hindering the plan that we have for it. Does this make sense? Say yes. Yeah. And so we had to remove some walls that were closing it off. And we had to remove the drop ceiling that closed it in. And, and we took out the old nasty toilet and we ripped out the outdated carpet and we've been replacing old electrical in order to make this store into what our plan is for it. Does this make sense? There, in order to, to bring this store into alignment with the plan that we have for it, some demo has to be done, right? Does this make sense? Does this make sense? Does this make sense? The same is true of our faith. In order for, for us to, to be who God has intended us to be, in order to accomplish what he is intending us to accomplish through Grace Farm, there has to be some demo. And the Bible is going to give us a roadmap on how to do this. Hear me? Right, girls? The Bible's going to give us the roadmap on how to do this. In Ephesians, if you just read the book of Ephesians, there is a roadmap. There are blueprints on how to align our lives with Jesus so that we aren't building that wall. And so, so what wall do you have in your life? Maybe, maybe the wall of sin that you are building between you and God is dishonesty. And, and, and you've been lying and, and you've been keeping secrets, but Ephesians 5 or Ephesians 4 tells us that honesty is what honors God. Yeah? And so Ephesians, man, it's going to give you the blueprints that you need so that you can pursue God, so that you can demo this wall that's been between you and him. Maybe your wall is stealing. The Bible tells you to work hard for the things that you have. And as you work hard, you are going to honor God. Maybe, maybe the wall that you've been putting up between you and God is because of the corrupting talk that's been coming out of your mouth. The crude things that you're saying, the, the jokes that you've been telling, the things that you've been laughing at, the way that you talk with your friends. And God is saying, listen, I, I want you to have grace-filled talk. Yeah? Maybe... Maybe the wall that you're building is, is because you just have a lot of malice toward the people around you. You've been, you've been doing harm to people around you, and you feel no remorse for it. You're, you're, you're the person that, man, you, you hurt somebody, and then you just walk away. Like, well, it was an accident. And when you get hurt, it's the end of the world. Everybody needs to stop, and they need to help you because you're hurt. But when you hurt somebody, it's like, well, whatever. Accidents happen. You just walk away. But, but, but the Holy Spirit wants to tell you, listen, I want you to be tenderhearted. I want you to be helpful. I want you to be empathetic for the people around you. Maybe your wall has to do with sexual immorality. We talked about this in our Hot Topic series, that, that God's plan for our lives is not to be sexually immoral. God has a design for sex, but that design has to come in his time. Yes? God's design comes with God's time. And so instead of being sexually immoral, pursue sexual purity. Maybe it's because you, you, you've been coveting. You've been looking at what everybody else has and you're, you, you want it. Man, I wish that I had. I wish that I had. I wish that I had. But the Bible tells us to be content. Maybe you've been being controlled by substances. I know that nobody in here outside of some of my leaders is old enough to drink, is old enough to smoke, is old enough to do any of that stuff. But I'm not naive enough to believe that you have it. And so maybe your life is being controlled by a substance. The Bible tells us not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. And all of these things can build a wall, but if we dive into God's Word, we can figure out how to remove it. Yes? 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 So we need to lean into doing some demo work. And that demo work begins with a decision to repent. We gotta, we gotta make that choice to repent. The Holy Spirit's gonna do the hard work, y'all. The Holy Spirit's going to be the one to begin to remove those things in our lives when we posture ourselves to say, God, I missed it. Just like David, right? David said, I sinned. I messed up. I sinned against the Lord. The Holy Spirit's going to come in and he's going to begin to do some demo work on those things. But when we miss it, we have to be willing to own it. Yes? We got to be willing to own it. And, and so we get to see David's response kind of at the end of the story. We're going to see his response in Psalm 51. And so really quickly, I want to look at Psalm 51. And figure out what do we do when, when we see the wall going up, what do we do? And so David writes this psalm in regards to the sin that he had covered up and, and how it was addressed by Nathan. In Psalm 51, he says this, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love and according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wipe away my sin. Wash me 
through uh, thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I know my transgressions my sin is ever before me against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight and so David says I missed it when we see this wall going up between us and God if, if we want to be the people that God is calling us to be the first thing we have to do is own it right yeah. we own it this is my wall this is the wall that I built. God, against you and you alone have I sinned. I'm not trying to hide it anymore. I'm not trying to cover it up anymore. I'm not trying to make people think that I'm better than I actually am. God, I, 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 I'm, this is my sin. And we own it. The next thing David goes on to say, verses 7 through 10, he says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. As we own it, we need to understand that then God takes it. Yes? When, when we own it, God takes it. And we can trust that Jesus, through his redemptive work on the cross, has covered our sins if we will trust in him. Yes? 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 And so once we own it and God begins to take it, Psalm 51, 12 through 13 says, Reju Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach, your transgress teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. He says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And so when we own it, God takes it, and then we get to walk in joy. Yeah? When we get to walk in joy, and there is something special about when we when we allow the Holy Spirit to do this demo work in our life, that he's able to move freely from front to back and side to side in our life, and he's able to guide us and lead us and, and do whatever he wants to do in and through our lives. There's something special about that, and we get to walk in that joy. And we'll not only begin to experience new joy in our faith, but we also get to experience new opportunities to act out in grace toward our neighbors and so really when we confess and we repent of the sin that creates the walls between us and God we're opening up our relationship with him through through obedience and becoming more holy and, and, and better able to listen and act upon the Holy Spirit's promptings in our lives and so in just a minute I know that we're running out of time we're, we're gonna end at 805 we're gonna take an extra five ten minutes to, to do something we're, we're going to do a group grace bond tonight Instead of splitting out into small groups, we're going to do a group grace bomb. Somebody say group. 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 We're going to do a group grace bomb. And, and, and it, is, uh, it is teacher appreciation week. And so we're just going to love on our teachers and our faculty. And so I'm going to explain to you what we're going to do with that here in just a minute. But before we get into that, there's a couple things that I want to talk about. So everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. As, as we kind of bring this to a close, the first thing that we have to understand is that sin puts up a barrier between us and God. And if you have never invited Jesus to come into your life and be your Lord, your leader, your Savior, if you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, then you are still living separated from God. And right where you're at tonight, you can say, Jesus, forgive me. I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a Savior. I, I, I can't fix myself. I can't save myself and I'm done trying. Jesus, I'm sorry for what I've done. Help me to be the person that you are calling me to be. I invite you to be my Lord, my leader, my, my, my savior. God, I believe what the Bible says about you, Jesus, that you were, were slain on my behalf and you rose from the dead three days later. And because you are alive, I can come alive in you. Jesus, I love you and I want to give you the rest of my life. If, if you want to make that decision for the very first time, you can do that right where you're at. And if you're here and, and you've made that decision before, but you are beginning to recognize that there is still sin in your life, there's still sin in your heart, and, and there's still a wall between you and God because you went back to those things, you went back to those old habits, you went back to those old patterns. If that's you, right where you're at, you can say, Lord, against you and you alone have I sinned. I've missed it. I've messed up. God, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't want this wall to be between us anymore. And as you own it, he's going to begin to take it. He's going to begin to work on you. And that demo day is going to begin. And you're going to see those things begin to move out of your life as you trust God and you lean into the choices that he is calling you to make. So whether 
either of those things or both of those things or neither of those things work for you, I just want to pray. And as I pray, whichever one of those applies to you, and just begin to ask God to take that. Jesus, I just thank you so much. I thank you for this group of students, God. And we thank you ultimately for you, your, your death on the cross, Jesus, your love for us, your great love for us, that you gave your life for us, that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet separated from God, you gave your life for us. And so, Jesus, we just thank you for that. We desire that you would move freely in our lives, Holy Spirit. We don't want to quench what you are doing. And so help us to make choices that honor you and stop building that wall between us and you, Lord, because we, we, we want to be the people you're calling us to be. We want the influence of the Holy Spirit to point us in the direction of people who are so far from you that they, they just need a touch, they need a word, they need encouragement. God, help us to be those people to reach out to them. But if we're going to reach out to them, we got to work on us too. So God, help us. Forgive us. Point us in your direction. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. Amen.